The aircraft that I will talk about today doesn't look as impressive as the Boeing 747 nor as distinctive as the Douglas DC-10 or even a Lockheed 1011 TriStar. It just looks, I guess, ordinary and it turns out that that is exactly the point. The Airbus 300 was the very first twin-engine widebody, a configuration shared by all widebody airliners available in the market today and that's for a very good reason. And as well as being basically the blueprint for modern widebodies, the A300 was the aircraft that practically launched the company Airbus as we know it today. So how did the Airbus A300 come to be and why did Airbus decide to start off with a widebody aircraft of all things? Stay tuned. Before we begin, I have a little quiz for you. As some of you might know, Airbus eventually replaced today's subject, the A300, with the Airbus A330 back in 1992. But when do you think Airbus actually stopped producing the A300? The production between old and new models usually overlap by a few months or sometimes even years, but how long do you think that it took before the A300 was completely phased out? Well, think about that and I'll come back to it later on. Now, it's not really possible to talk about the history of the Airbus A300 without also talking about the history of Airbus itself. Today, Airbus has surpassed Boeing as the world's largest manufacturer of commercial aircraft and it all started with the A300. But how, and more importantly, why was Airbus created in the first place? Well, to understand that, we need to look back at what Europe's aviation industry looked like back in the 1960s. And we also need to look at what kind of competition that the Europeans were up against at the time. Now, Britain, France, West Germany and some other European countries still had aviation industries, which contained some pretty big names back in the 1960s. Britain, for example, had Hawker Siddeley, after a merger of some really big names who were dating back to before World War II. France had Breguet Aviation and a series of state-owned aerospace companies like Nord Aviation and Sud Aviation who later would merge to become Aerospatiale. Other French aviation companies included Dassault and of course engine manufacturer Snecma, which we today know as Safran. There was also Dornier in Germany, Fokker in the Netherlands, Casa in Spain and Saab in Sweden and I'm sure there, there are also a couple of others that I'm just forgetting right now. Now, individually, some of these companies did have some successes, but primarily in their home markets. But by the 1960s, the managers of most of these companies eventually understood that their small size and their small home markets were both serious problems for them. And they also understood that neither of these problems would get much easier to deal with as time moved forward. So concentrating on the home markets just wasn't a sustainable strategy for any airplane maker who wanted to survive in the future. And whilst the Europeans were figuring this out, the United States was experiencing a true industrial boom and obviously its aviation business formed part of that. The American space program was already underway at this point and military spending remained at a very high level, which both meant that innovation coming out of both of these sectors was spilling into the commercial aviation sector as well. In short, funding in the United States aviation world was not a problem and the demand from airlines around the world for American-made jets was also pretty high. Remember, back then the United States had both Boeing, McDonnell Douglas and Lockheed all making and designing airliners for the world market. So how were the small European companies faring against their American rivals then? Well, after the de Havilland Comet, which I have actually looked at in another video, there had been a couple of successful European aircraft, like the Sud Aviation Caravelle, which entered service in 1959, the Hawker Siddeley Trident, who looked like a European 727, and the BAC 111, who entered service in 1965 and looked kind of like a European DC-9. There was also the Vickers VC-10 with its four rear-mounted engines that looked like, well, I guess almost nothing else except maybe the Ilyushin EL-62. Now, that might sound like a respectable list of aircraft, but the production numbers told a very different and quite a lot more gloomy story. Sud Aviation eventually made 282 caravels, which wasn't too bad, but Along with the Comet, which didn't sell that well at all, the Caravelle was the oldest type that I've mentioned so far. 
Hawker Sidley made 117 Tridents and Vickers made just 54 VC-10s and that included the military variants of it. The smaller BAC or BAC-111 did a bit better with 244 aircraft and Fokker's slightly newer F-28 Fellowship also made okay with 241 aircraft produced. <laughs> I actually did my own MCC course on that one, it was really cool. But to truly get the picture here, we need to put these numbers into some kind of perspective. Boeing sold 1,832 727s and just the first generation or the Jurassic 737-100 and 200 models sold 1,144 aircraft. On top of that, McDonnell Douglas sold nearly 1,000 DC-9s, not including the newer MD-80s and MD-90 models and this all meant that the Americans weren't just outselling the Europeans, they were completely eclipsing them. And in the 1960s, Boeing, McDonnell Douglas and Lockheed were all busy preparing to sell their new wide bodies, the Boeing 747, the McDonnell Douglas DC-10 and the Lockheed L-1011 TriStar. So how do you compete with established industry giants like that? Well, the Europeans knew that in order to stand any chance at all, they had to join forces, but what type of aircraft would they make? Well, you could say that the very first aircraft they actually made together in some sort of cooperation was the Concorde. But I think that we can also all agree that this was a very special case, which frankly didn't go very well from a business perspective either. But if we look historically, Concorde actually did show a way of thinking about competing with in the aviation world, which would influence some early Airbus decisions, including the design of the A300. And I'll explain what I mean by that after this. This episode is sponsored by Exter, which is a company that makes these really cool card holders and wallets that can hold up to 12 different cards at once. And one thing that I think is really cool with them is that they come with this tracking unit and it's basically like a card and you leave it out in the sun for two hours and that will give you up to three months of tracking time, which is perfect for me because I tend to always leave my wallets everywhere anyway. Exter was the first company that created these data theft and skimming protected wallets, which is great in today's society. Um, what I really love with them is that it's really thin, even with six cards that I'm using now, because I tend to use my wallet in my front pocket and it doesn't bulge as much. Now, if you're interested in checking this out, they have a lot of different products as well that you can check out in the website. So if you are interested in getting this perfect gift for yourself or maybe someone you love, then go to exter.com and use the discount code MENTOR. That will give you up to 35% discount if you shop before the 10th of November. Click on the link below and check them out. Now, the Airbus A300 is a wide-body aircraft, and if you think about it, that's a bit of a strange choice for a new company's first ever airliner. Usually, when an aircraft company first starts up, they have two choices for what their inaugural product will be. Since New companies are usually small and often have trouble finding funding. They might want to start by going for a market niche, something that the established big names haven't really addressed very well. Or if the company thinks that funding isn't really a problem, well, then they can dive straight in with a product that has as wide of a market reach as possible, attacking their competitors head on. In the 1960s, the Americans already offered a wide range of single-aisle aircraft with the 727, the 737 and the DC-9 families. Long haul was taken care of by the Boeing 707 and the DC-8 and meanwhile they were of course also working on those wide bodies that I already mentioned. So what could the Europeans actually do? Would they choose to take on the Americans directly with that first ever Airbus in complete cooperation, or maybe do something different instead. <laughs> well, well, to understand just how badly things could have gone for Airbus, it's worth looking at a different aircraft called the Dassault Mercure 100. And if you haven't heard of that plane before, well, you are not alone. Only 12 of them were ever built, and that included the prototypes, the first of which flew back in 1971. The Mercure was basically an early attempt by Dassault to compete with the 737 and it looked like a cross between a 737-200 and an Airbus A320. Now one thing that made the Mercure notable and actually the reason that I mention it here was that it was one of the very first projects that aimed to create a European airliner by combining efforts from multiple countries. 
French manufacturer Dassault remained in charge of the project with some financial backing by the French government, but companies in Italy, Spain, Belgium and Switzerland also made structural parts of the aircraft. Dassault even claimed that as a European project, the Mercure's development predated even the Concords. Now, mm, I'm not sure that the dates actually agree with that, but ultimately it didn't really matter because the Mercure was a monumental flop. What happened was that Dassault had tried to optimize the aircraft's efficiency for short-haul trips in order to create its own niche, but its range was so short that almost nobody wanted it. Air Inter in France was the type's only operator, buying 11 out of the 12 made, and they eventually kept using the planes for around two decades, so it looks like they actually were quite efficient, but their niche was simply too small to matter. Dassault later considered developing a longer range version with CFM56 engines, but after what happened with the first version, they didn't dare to take that chance, and instead they just stuck with fighters and business jets instead. So, if Dassault couldn't make a single aisle short haul aircraft to compete with the Americans, well, then how did Airbus do it? And especially with a much bigger, more expensive, and therefore much riskier A300. Remember, the Americans were already busy developing their own wide bodies at this point. Well, as it turned out, the European companies, which by the way weren't called Airbus at this point yet, had found another market niche, and it was a much better one than the one that Dassault had gambled on, or the supersonic niche of the Concorde for that matter. The Airbus A300 would be a wide body, but it was built to be a bit smaller than all of the other American wide bodies on the construction. And, and like I said in the very beginning, it also had two engines, which would turn out to be a design decision key to the type's success, and also combined with a little bit of luck. Now you might think at this point that the three American manufacturers probably wanted their designs to work for long-haul oceanic flights, where three or four engines was the bare minimum at the time, and you would be absolutely right there. But it's worth remembering that all three of these manufacturers also made medium haul versions of these large jets, including the 747-100 and the DC-10-10, which is a DC-10-10, and as well as the L-1011-1. They did that because in some markets, even short haul flights with really large capacity aircraft made total sense. And that was the market that Airbus targeted with the A300. They were building a big twin-engine jet that would bus people around the skies. And that saying, Airbus, basically stuck with the new company as a name because Airbus or Airbus worked in both English and French. Initially, the aircraft was intended to have seats for 300 passengers in a typical two-class configuration. And that's where the A300 name came from. Now, deciding on the size of the aircraft wasn't an easy process to do. There were previous ideas for other European collaborations, most of them for smaller aircraft, but when the Airbus 300 or A300 was eventually agreed upon, it would be a joint British, French and German project for a 300-seat twin jet. The initial agreement between the three governments meant that Britain and France had bigger work shares than Germany, 37.5% each, and Germany would get 25%, and Britain's share was big because Hawker Sidley would design the wing, while Rolls-Royce would develop a new engine based on the RB211, who was also, by the way, powering the Lockheed 1011. But that agreement didn't last very long. Eventually, it was decided that the 300 passenger capacity was a bit too much to handle, so Hawker Sidley designed a wing that would be very efficient for a jet carrying around 250 passengers instead. And importantly, that also meant that the now smaller aircraft wouldn't need a bespoke engine, so the new configuration would greatly reduce the project's both cost and risk. But this wing also meant that Rolls-Royce was no longer a key partner in the program, reducing the work part of the United Kingdom. The original A300 would end up never getting any Rolls-Royce engines fitted to it, and eventually Britain officially left the program altogether. This meant that France and Germany became 50-50 partners instead, but Britain's Hawker Sidley still continued as a key subcontractor supplying the wings. And to this day, all Airbus wings are still made in Britain at an Airbus site that used to be a Hawker Sidley facility. 
The only exception to this is the Airbus A220, since it originated as the Canadian Bombardier C series, but the wing for that aircraft is actually also made in the UK, in Belfast, Northern Ireland. That's actually close to where my lovely graphic designer Dominic comes from. Anyway, the now resized, smaller Airbus was initially named the A250, since it would now only have 250 seats, but by this time the A300 name had already stuck, so they simply just called it the A300 Bravo. The definitive cabin cross-section had a 242 seat layout and economy with plenty of space under the floor for large load devices or containers called LD3s, making it a good combined passenger and cargo aircraft. The initial production version was called the A300 Bravo 2, while the A300 Bravo 4 would later be launched as the longer ranged variant. The prototype Airbus A300 Bravo flew for the first time on the 28th of October 1972, almost exactly 51 years before this video was released. Now initially, sales of this new airliner was painfully slow. Obviously, Air France and Lufthansa bought it, since they were the two flag carriers of the project's home countries, and they put it in service back in 1974. But in other countries around the globe, interest in the aircraft was very, very slim, to say the least. New potential buyers weren't just worried about the aircraft's efficiency and reliability, they were also quite unsure about whether or not this new manufacturer consortium called Airbus would stick around long enough to actually support the aircraft once it was in service. Now, a lot has been said and written about the way that Airbus tried to woo airlines in the United States into investing in this new aircraft. A sale in the United States would, of course, definitely attract worldwide attention and work as a mark of confidence in the long-term success of the aircraft, so it was seen as a key for Airbus at the time. So in order to do that, partially, Airbus actually used Imperial or US customary units for the design of the A300, even though this wasn't really a wooing attempt. Airbus chose to do this primarily because of inputs from airlines like Lufthansa and Air France, who already had fleets of aircraft and warehouses full of spare parts measured in feet and inches. And Airbus also used English as the official language for all design documentations for that very same reason. In 1974, Airbus eventually made one of its most important international sales of the longer range, A300 Bravo 4, to Korean Air, but for just four aircraft. Then, between December of 1975 and May of 1977, Airbus made no sales at all, and things started to look really, really grim for the entire program. And that's why a lot of people today put a lot of significance in the fact that Airbus leased four A300s with very favorable terms to Eastern Airlines in the United States back in 1977. With very little to lose, Eastern tried the A300 and they became really impressed by what they saw. They agreed to turn those leases into firm orders for 23 A300s, with some people later complaining about the very favorable financial incentives given from the French and German governments. But that isn't really a very fair narration of the story. Because you see, government concessions and incentives might guarantee a few sales, and those kind of incentives weren't really that unusual either back in those days. But on their own, tricks like that don't really work out in the long term. Instead, there were two other events in the 1970s that meant that the A300 was in the right place at the right time. The first was the 1973 Yom Kippur War and the oil crisis that followed in its wake. This radically changed the value that the airlines placed on fuel efficiency on their aircraft, and it was probably the biggest reason why the Concorde basically made no sales outside of its home countries. This, by the way, was also the thing that put the final nail in the coffin of the American 2707 SST project that I talked about in a previous video. The other thing that happened was the adaptation of the ETOPS 90 rule for the first time. ETOPS stands for Extended Twin Engine Operation Performance Standards, and before this rule, all aircraft with two engines had to be no more than 60 minutes away from an alternate airport during flight. The ETOPS 90 rule extended its time to 90 minutes, making it easier for airlines to schedule long over water routes for twin engine aircraft like the Airbus A300. Now, today ETOPS has been extended way more than that, with many new widebodies starting off with 180 minute ETOPS approvals. 
And these limits have been extended as the planes and their engines become more and more mature. But the aircraft that truly got that ball rolling was the Airbus A300, all the way back in 1976. With the combination of these two factors, the fuel efficiency and ETOPS, suddenly the A300 was a lot more attractive to more players. This was especially true for airlines in Asia and Oceania, where the aircraft suddenly became the ideal option for many busy medium-haul routes who were planned over water. So that initial lease deal of those four aircraft to Eastern in 1977 turned out to be still extremely important, not because of any backroom incentives, but because Eastern discovered that the A300 burned up to 30% less fuel than their Lockheed 1011 ones did. And remember, those Lockheeds were still basically brand new aircraft at the time. And once Eastern had discovered that, they let the whole world know about it. So anyone who still didn't grasp the implications of the twin engine layout after the oil crisis did so overnight, thanks to this lease deal. Boeing was seemingly caught a little bit off guard about this and didn't launch the 767, their first twin engine widebody, until 1978. And it came into operation even later than that. And as they were working on that, Airbus just continued to develop the A300. In 1982, they flew the A310, which was a shorter version with some new and updated features, including a new wing and a two-person cockpit. The initial A300 had used a flight engineer, but after the A310, Airbus also introduced the updated A300-600, which had the same new wing as the A310 and also a two-person cockpit and some other improvements. That variant first entered service in 1984, and its freighter version was the very last A300 produced. Which brings me back to the question that I asked you in the beginning, when do you think the last A300 was produced by Airbus? The answer is incredibly in 2007, a full 15 years of the first flight of the updated model, the Airbus A330. And by the way, over 100 of these jets are still in service today with FedEx and UPS, and they're not that old, at least not in freighter terms. UPS is actually updating them with new avionics, so they'll likely stick around for many more years to come. In total, Airbus made over 560 A300s of all types, plus another 255 A310s, and actually the A330 may be a different type, but it has the basic same fuselage as the A300 did. When Airbus first started to study the aircraft that eventually became the A330, they actually called it the A300 Bravo 9, and the four-engine A340 was then called the A300 Bravo 11, so they are just basically evolutions of the basic A300. That means that if you consider the A300, the A310, the A330 and the A340 as a single family, well then Airbus has made 2,775 of them, plus another 100 or so A330 Neos. And if you think that that's not impressive enough, then just to show you the enduring design of the A300, when Airbus first announced plans to launch what they call the A350, that aircraft actually had an A330 fuselage, which we now know is basically an A300 fuselage with a new composite wing and some new engines. But eventually the airlines and lessers convinced Airbus to make a bigger all-new all-composite design instead, which is the Airbus A350 that we now know. But even though the A350 was coming, Airbus still made the A330neo anyway, fitted with new engines and an updated wing. And that aircraft is still making sales today, and is actually pretty close in efficiency to the all-composite Boeing 787, with similar engines fitted. Alright, I know that that was after a lot of updates and revisions, but it really does show how good that original A300 design was. So good that it's definitely part of the proud group that we have here in the Classic playlist. Now, which aircraft would you like me to feature next? Let me know in the comments below. I love hearing from you guys. Have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are and consider leaving a super thanks, maybe buying a t-shirt or even joining my awesome, fantastic Patreon crew. Bye-bye.